and see so here's your questions on Renaissance Reformation. I'll get to the Reformation in just a minute. Um, but let me pop up Age of Exploration just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about here a little better. Open. Oh, I love when things work really well here. There we go, okay. Sorry, everything's just deciding to be wonderful all at once. Here we go. And there we go. Okay. okay. Um, so here you got a map and where is my mouse? Thank you very much. All right. Um, if we're looking at this right here is where Constantinople is. All right. All of this across Persia to China had been a travel route that was open to Western Europe at the time that they went through uh, Constantinople and went off to Jerusalem to fight the Crusades and yet introduced all this trade material coming in. Okay, so then along come the Mongols in the 13th century and knock out that trade route. Well, Western Europe over here still wants to have that access, all right? So when we're talking about this rise of the Renaissance, and the push of kind of an intellectual curiosity as they begin to read about ancient Greek travels. Um, you actually have a guy, Marco Polo, not the pool game, who traveled overland through these Mongol territories and made his way to um, the capital of the Mongol Empire and brought back stuff from China and he comes back to Italy and they're like, oh, you have not been there. But then he has this stuff. He has paper. He has pasta. He has these trade commodities and they're looking at him. Well, the first thing they do is they actually throw him in jail because he hasn't been paying his bills for 20 years. Um, and then he writes this story of how he got over to China. All right, well that really, it becomes hugely popular and it really reignites this curiosity from Western Europe once they begin to get over these crises of the 14th century. And it pushes them to go out and explore and how are they going to get to China, which is their end goal, okay? So you have two major, um, attacks here, which is actually a good word for it. Um, now, everything is coming out of Portugal, right, which has this center of maritime studies under Prince Henry the Navigator, okay? So when you, when you do that, um, by the way, there's a switch in the reading and it flips you into the English, Spanish, French, Portuguese explorers. There's a reason why it's not in the first half book. So I threw the link in separate. Okay, so here's what they do. Um, because they have this tie, remember that I said that the remains of the Umayyad Caliphate had stretched across North Africa and extended into Spain, which is living under what's called the convivienza, meaning, let me pop this down here for a second. You have this mixed population 
in Spain that's Christian, Muslims, and Jews. And they're all living fairly happily together. And it ties Spain in to this larger Islamic trade network, right? Spain is kind of an accident of geography in the sense of being European because it's actually um, kind of walled off from the rest of Europe. Um, there's a set of mountains that go right across between Spain and France called the Pyrenees. And that kind of serves as a barrier. So Spain is part of Europe, but they're tied into this larger trade network, right, that extends across North Africa, through the Arabian Peninsula, over uh, Persia, and across that. Um, okay. They're also really well situated because of ocean tides. So if you sail out from Portugal and Spain, it kind of pushes you out here and then down the coast of West Africa. Um, so you have this very active school of exploration in the 15th century. And uh, Bartolomé Diaz is one of the first guys who begins to explore, like, could we get to China by going around Africa? Um, and the pre one of the prevalent thoughts at the time was that, hmm, um, no, you can't because you would sail too close to the edge of the flat earth and fall off and be eaten by dragons because people thought the earth was flat. However, going in with that um, ancient Greek math, science, philosophy, uh, art, literature, music. They had this former Greek exploration. They had this former Greek mathematician, a guy named Ptolemy in the first century, who did some kind of math voodoo, I guess it's trigonometry, um, put a stick in the ground and calculated out from its shadow the circumference of the earth, meaning the distance all the way around. And he was right within about 80 miles, which for not having a calculator, pretty cool. Um, so he's of this opinion that the earth is round. And remember, that's part of the literature that's making its way through Western Europe at this point. Okay, so um, Diaz begins to explore the coast of West Africa, and then he claims this territory in the Gold Coast. Um, Vasco da Gama is the guy who comes along a little bit later, and he's the guy who first gets around the tip of South Africa and into the Indian Maritime Ocean, Indian Ocean trade system. Now, he thinks that he is just the most advanced dude. He's like an astronaut. He's in this state-of-the-art 66-foot caravel with lanteen states. This is like the most techno awesome ship Western Europe has to offer. And he's got the new uh, rudder that's being used. They've, they've picked this up through um, um, technology transfers. They've got new navigation technology from the Islamic network. Okay, so he thinks he is just all that as he cruises into the Indian Ocean. Hang on, who's talking? Sorry? Okay, anyway, um, he cruises over there and he's immediately met by these 400 foot ships from the Chinese Navy. And he feels like this big. He is like, wait, I was really, and they're like, hey, you all used to be trading with us. What happened? Um, so that's the one aspect of it as they get over into Asia and the trades going on. They set up these little trade uh, networks in India and they get over to China. Okay, now here's the second version of this. Uh, Christopher Columbus, who just had a statue taken down of him, which is really cool. Uh, Christopher Columbus has this idea 
that if the world is really round, I could sail west and get to the east, which would be accurate if he had any way of knowing that there were two entire continents in the way, but he doesn't know that. So he gets his ships, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, and he goes cruising west, lands in the Caribbean, um, gets out onto this island in the Caribbean and claims it in the name of Spain. Um, now Spain, and I'm going to flip over here again, Spain had by this point begun a process called the Reconquista, meaning that they are trying to conquer all of Spain and expel non-Christians. Most of that had been done by the 13th century, but the last uh, Islamic kingdom of Granada is captured in 1492, which is also the year that Columbus seals the ocean blue. But the thing about Spain that you need to keep in mind is that they have this other pre-existing system called the encomienda, a labor system, which forced Muslims to provide labor part of the year. The rest of the year, they're free to do their own thing, but he has to work for a Christian nobleman. So they already have this idea of using captive labor when they get to the Caribbean, okay? Um, they did, in the process of the 14th century, offer the opportunity to convert for Jews and Muslims, but you also have the Spanish Inquisition going on, which is a bunch of Dominican monks who are gonna come torture you to make sure your conversion is really sincere. Okay, so, Columbus lands in the Caribbean on the island of Haiti, which quickly gets named Hispaniola, and then begins to target the Arawak population, um, the indigenous population that comes down to meet him. And he's like, so where's the gold? Where's the silk? Where's all this stuff? And they're like, what? No, you know, this does not meet what he thought he was going to get when he landed in India. But he was convinced he had landed in India. Now, certain, as he goes back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean and goes back to Spain and people begin doing further explorations, so they're like, no, dude, you found something way better than India. But he was like, no, I found India on his deathbed. He was like, I found India. No, you found the Caribbean and you found the Americas which had people in it, by the way. He didn't just discover it, he encountered it, right? But here come the Spanish and they have weapons and they have uh, the ability, they also have, they're carrying um, smallpox, which in Europe, people get smallpox, it's not great. You may live, you may die. Um, <coughs> pardon me, you'll probably live, you may be uh, uh, marked from it, but there's no immunity to this. There's no resistance to this in the Americas and it decimates the population. And I'm bringing this up because as you begin this process of forcing the labor of the indigenous population, once they die out, you're going to be looking for a new source of labor. And that is what is going to start the transatlantic slave trade coming from Africa to the Americas. Okay. Um, and we do actually have these documents of what is happening in the Americas. Uh, we also have, this was an early cover for a firsthand account that's written by a guy named Bartolomeo um, de las Casas, which he calls a short account of the destruction of the Indies. And he is writing about the decimation, the rape, murder, 
enslavement, mutilation, torture of the indigenous population for the benefit of the Spanish who did not find gold, but they found something much more vital, which was sugar. And they're going to create this transatlantic trade by using sugar and using that already existing encomienda system to further the Spanish economy. Okay. Um, and what that's going to do is it's not going to take too much longer before in 1519, um, you're going to see the jump from the Caribbean to the coast of Mexico, landing at Veracruz and marching in to overthrow the Aztec Empire. Again, you're turning professional soldiers with firepower, with cannons, with guns, and on horseback um, against a population that did not have this. And again, the same aspect with the uh, lack of resistance to disease. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop right there for you because now I've set the stage for you. But there's a couple of things that are going to come out of this. And that is, let me flip this back here. Um, what's going to come out of this is that, A, you've got this big push for colonies, right? Um, in Western Europe, you're going to start up this competition between these nation states, France, England, Spain, the Netherlands, um, the Holy Roman Empire. All of them want to get in on this action, right? Now, one thing that Spain claimed that they were doing in all of this was to spread Christianity. Well, that's complete fictitious nonsense, but that's the veneer that they're putting on here. Um, because at the same time that all of this is breaking out, you're going to have the rise of the Protestant Reformation. And I'll take that on for you uh, in the next video blurb that I do for you. Okay. All right. Um, I will stop this now and answer any questions that you all have going for you. I see somebody is um, typing something up here. Okay.